Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aki, and uh, I am the head of mobile at Zappos.com. Uh, so um, I'm not a you know model, so it's the first time kind of trying to work on a runway. Uh, I think uh, it's a first for me, so I'm very excited about going back home and telling people, hey, I walked down the walkway and the catway and tried to behave like a model. But, <laughs> I, I don't know who in their right mind thought I would be able to make it here. But anyhow, um, so I am the uh, head of mobile at Zappos.com, and um, Let's see if I can manage to get this to work. Is it? Ah, oh, there we go. So uh, how many people here are familiar, or actually I should ask the opposite way. How many people are not familiar with Zappos.com? Please raise your hands. Oh, excellent. Oh, this is great. So, um, uh, you know, I live in the United States and I do a lot of these talks. And um, it's a weird experience for me when I go out there and say, hey, how many people here uh, know of Zappos.com? Uh, because I have been with the company for a very long time. And when I started working at Zappos, I would tell people, hey, I work for this company called Zappos. And I was like, what the heck is that? And in my mind, I have that so ingrained that for so long, I always thought that I was working for this company that nobody would ever hear about. So nowadays, when I go out there and I um, you know, go to these conferences and I ask people, how many people here know of Zappos.com? And everybody raises their hands. It's like, oh, what's going on? This too weird. Uh, but uh, this is great, so I can get to talk a little bit about Zappos. Uh, Zappos was founded in San Francisco in 1999 by uh, a gentleman called uh, Nick Swimmer. He uh, discovered the fact that buying shoes for himself online was particularly difficult, and he was shocked uh, about that fact. So what he decided to do is start an online website that sold shoes. Um, and the operation back then was so small that he was able to get people from the office, go down the street, go to Nordstrom's or you know, uh, Macy's or wherever, and buy the shoes that we were sh shipping out to customers. So, <laughs> uh, and believe it or not, that was a problem that people were having. You know, people all over the United States didn't have access to all the retail, uh, uh, retailers that you know, are available to like, the big cities. So, you know, uh, Nick came up with this concept. He started just selling, sending people over from the office to buy product and sell, uh, send it to customers. And that was working. Obviously, that wasn't going to scale. So uh, the uh, a big plan was to develop a dropship, a dropship uh, shipping system, which uh, we would put in place. And by 2001, uh, the company did $1.6 million in sales. Uh, and that was great. You know, we, we continued to grow. Uh, but by 2003, we abandoned uh, this dropshipping business. Uh, dropshipping, the concept behind it was that we would have a website, people would come in, place an order, and then we would send the order to the brands, and the brands would then fulfill the order for us. So the idea was we, we didn't have to carry any inventory. We didn't have to manage a warehouse. We didn't have to you know, worry about maintaining the product, shipping it out. The brands were going to take care of all of that. All we needed to do was build the technology, take the orders, send the orders to the brands, and, uh, and, you know, uh, and just continue to take orders. What we found was that when we were taking all these orders from all, uh, customers on our website, um, the brands were not fulfilling uh, all of these orders right away. So you know, if you're a big brand and you got like a couple of orders from some person, you're not going to make that your first priority. As a brand, you're shipping products to all these big you know, uh, retailers as well. So you know, if you're doing business with Nordstrom, Macy's, et cetera, you're going to probably fulfill those orders first and then get to like, the couple of orders that Zappos was sending over. So for us, as a company, that created a problem because our customers weren't happy. People were coming in, placing an order. They weren't getting it right away. Uh, another problem that we found uh, was the fact that all of these brands had to keep their inventory levels there, you know, all of the information up uh, and up to date uh, on their systems for us to know what was available. And a lot of these brands weren't uh, particularly careful about maintaining all this information. So people will come in, place an order, and you know, a week later, we will get a brand telling us, sorry, we don't have that product. Then we'll have to write, uh, tell our customers, uh, sorry, you know, you placed this order a week ago, but we, we don't have it. 
uh, was a terrible, terrible customer experience. So it's really a miracle that we made like $1.6 million in 2001. Uh, uh, so in 2003, I believe, um, actually at the end of 2002, um, uh, our uh, you know, um, CEO, uh, Tony Shea, uh, said, you know what, for Christmas, let's not do any dropship. Let's, you know, by this time, by you know, 2002, we started carrying a lot of inventory in-house and uh, selling it out out of necessity, really, because uh, you know, some brands would not uh, let us drop ships. We, they, they were forcing us to actually carry inventory in-house or, uh, ourselves. So we started to kind of develop a little bit of that business. And uh, so Tony said, well, you know, let's just, for Christmas, shut down all drop ship. Let's ship all the inventory in-house so that we don't disappoint customers. Let's make sure that you know, when people come and do their Christmas shopping, we were not gonna, they're not going to go home empty-handed. So that was crazy talk <laughs> for us, because it was, you know, dropship was such a big part of our business. We were like, what are you talking about, Tony? So, uh, uh, but we did it, and our customers were so happy that they were getting all their product. And then uh, you know, after the holiday season where I was over, Tony came back and said, you know what? We're going to carry inventory. So, we developed our own warehouse, <laughs> which to me was really insane, because I, I think uh, any of us who started working at Zappos at the beginning, we were sold on this idea that the company was going to be doing dropshipping, and that's all we were going to do, ever do. And that the reason why we were going to make money is because we were not going to carry inventory, we were not going to develop a warehouse, we were not going to ship product. And now, come the end of 2002, uh, you know, he goes, we're going to carry inventory, we're going to ship product, we're going to build a warehouse. We're like, okay. Uh, and I personally was involved in building the uh, receiving, picking, shipping, put away. <laughs> uh, code that had been shipped out to Kentucky and working out there for about a year. Uh, things that I never thought I, I could do. But uh, thanks to that, by 2004, we had $184 million in sales. By 2008, we had $1 billion in sales. And in 2009, we were acquired by Amazon. So uh, that's a little bit about the Zappos story. Um, let's see if I can oh, maybe go back one. Let's, can we do that? There we go. So um, about the company. So Zappos is really, uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the company, it's a little bit of a wacky place to work at. Uh, and you know, we make it our goal to deliver happiness. That's like the big goal that Tony had set up on us. And what does that mean? Uh, to us, it means uh, making sure that we go above and beyond for our customers. Uh, taking long phone calls from a customer, having a, a long a phone conversation, is not seen as a bad thing. In fact, uh, Zappos is known for that uh, going above and beyond thing that uh, we have our longest call uh, on record is 10 hours and 29 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's a little crazy, but we, we don't go to those co you know, uh, customer service reps and go, what were you doing? That's crazy. You, you're not supposed to do that. Instead, we want to find out, what did you do to keep that customer engaged for so long? What, what were you guys talking about? You know, we, um, we pride ourselves in building that personal you know, uh, emotional connection, PEC is what we call it, uh, making sure that when we talk to a customer that we get to know them, that we, they get to know us. And that sort of builds that sort of uh, brand loyalty that, that we are very well known for. Um, another thing that Zappos is known for as well is um, during the holiday time, we have this program called the Holiday Helper. And what that is is everybody in, com in the company, including myself, we have to actually take calls from customers at least 10 hours during the holiday season, talk to customers, take orders, deal with their problems, whatever it may be. Every year, I get a little bit nervous right before I take my very first call. So I, I sit down, I put my headphone on, and I'm like, oh God, I'm about to take a customer order. Uh, how is this going to go? But you know, by the end, I end up loving it. And like, every time, it's just a really, really good experience. And that's because we, you know, the goal of any person uh, taking calls from our customers is to make sure that we satisfy whatever need they have. So we, and, and to create that personal emotional connection. I mean, I, I talked to uh, a lady that made me talk to her parrot for like five minutes, uh, just because. Uh, and again, like just crazy, crazy stories. Let's see. So, uh, and uh, I was here to kind of touch to talk about a little bit of mobile, just because that's kind of our new frontier. And so I have a, a few uh, metrics to share with you. So over 58% of all American adults own uh, smartphones in the, uh, 
uh, over 63% of them uh, uh, use their phones to go online. Uh, an average smartphone user checks their phone 150 times a day. Like, you, you don't really think about this, but you know, when it all kind of starts to sink in, these are pretty significant changes in the way that everybody goes about their lives. Uh, within 15 minutes of waking up, four out of five smartphone, uh, smartphone users checks their phone. Like, that's crazy, right? Like, I mean, it, it, before we had cell phones, uh, smartphones, we didn't have this behavior. Now it's almost like instinctual. You wake up, you reach up for your phone, whether it is to turn off your alarm or actually go into you know, social media and check out what your friends were doing last night or check out your email to see what's coming, going, on, out of, uh, going on at work. I mean, our lives have changed quite dramatically and, you know, uh, and it is because of these devices. Uh, smartphone owners between the ages of uh, 18 and 24 on average send 60 text messages a day. Uh, and that may not be necessarily just text messages, that could be through WhatsApp, uh, Line, uh, Kick Messenger, et cetera. Uh, on average, smartphone users spend about 34 hours a month browsing the web, as opposed to 27 hours a month on a PC. So for the first time in the United States, we're starting to see that people are actually browsing the web more often on their, mob their mobile devices than on uh, desktops or uh, laptops. So a little bit about the Zappos mobile journey. So for us, you know, we saw the, the, uh, the release of the iPhone in uh, 2008. We didn't necessarily jump on it and thought, this is the next frontier. We've got to be ahead. We've got to do uh, something about this. We kind of saw it as a new gadget, you know, maybe something interesting, but not particularly the wave of the future. We're like, OK, some people are carrying these phones that have browsers in them. Awesome. Uh, in 2009, uh, we were developing uh, our front-end uh, infrastructure a little bit more, and we were uh, experimenting with different layouts. And uh, we developed a technology that by changing the subdomain, so instead of having zappos.com, having something like clarks.zappos.com will create a clarks-specific brand uh, website. And uh, when we were doing that, some of our geeky developers uh, decided to just go ahead and create an iPhone-specific website. They said, like, if we can do that for any particular subdomain, can we build one for the iPhone? We went ahead, we built it. Well, it's cute. I mean, it's nice. Uh, there was not a lot of engagement or traction necessarily there. Well, we built it, and we started to track the activity. Uh, I think that the Zappos strategy, like the really official strategy, started in 2010 with the release of the iPad. We started to see whether there would be any engagement in apps. Would customers be interested in downloading a native app? Would customers be interested in downloading a Zappos iPad app and, and using it? Um, so we uh, went down that path. We developed that Zappos app. And lo and behold, customers were using that and loving it. And so in 2011, we released an iPhone, Android, and a Kindle app as well. And in 2013, uh, we started experimenting and tried a Windows 8 app tablet. So let's see if I can get that quicker to work. No? Okay. Sorry. There we go. So a little bit about uh, tablets versus phones. I think a lot of people it's still kind of mix when they talk about mobile. Like some people would talk about tablets and phones together. Some people separate them. So I kind of want to talk about the differences between tablets and phones because a lot of people, unfortunately, are you know, depending on where they come from, they may associate mobile to be tablets and phones when I think they are very different devices. The first thing is kind of obvious. I don't think that you have to be necessarily in this uh, conference to know that the screen size is different. <laughs> but it makes a big difference. Uh, the screen size on a tablet will dictate the amount of features that you're going to have available uh, on your app. Uh, and that may not necessarily be, you know, a, a, a big sort of a shift, but that uh, actually, when you look at the phone, it makes it even more critical. When you, where you're designing UI for the phone, you have to be very, very um, precise and very uh, methodical about picking out the features that are important for phone users, because the phone has a much smaller screen size, and if you don't have, if you put features that are not particularly critical, it's gonna eat up all that, all that space. Also on the phone, because you need that top, topable area, a lot of the buttons tend to be 
larger, so they take even more space from all their features. So you have to be very, very careful about what you pick on your mobile phone. And again, that will create a very different strategy uh, for you when developing a tablet app versus an iPhone app or a phone app. Uh, data, that's uh, also very critical. So tablets, it turns out, people use with, uh, through wireless uh, networks, whereas phones are typically used through uh, wireless uh, data uh, networks, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, cell phone data networks. So even though on your tablet, you, m you may be at home using your wireless network and getting you know, a, lot of, a lot of data back and forth, on your phone, even when you get LTE, you may get like maybe two bars at most, uh, <laughs> depending on where you are. So developing features on the phone that trans transfer a lot of data, whether it's video, uh, images, etc., may not necessarily be your best bet. Uh, whereas on the tablets, because you are connected to a wireless network, you, you probably are able to get even more information, more data uh, uh, quicker. So the types of features that you develop for the tablet can be more uh, engaging and, uh, and more richer uh, rich. Uh, then you have difference between portable versus pocketable. And this is kind of an interesting uh, different difference as well. Uh, tablets are portable. You can move them around. And they're almost, if you're talking about you know, kind of mobility, tablets are almost just as mobile as laptops are. People carry those around you know, almost to the same extent, whereas a phone, People carry them to the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy, but I mean, people carry these things everywhere. Uh, so the way in which customers use their phones and tablets are going to be very different. The times of uh, the day when they use them, uh, the intent, uh, the, you know, what they're trying to do with these devices are going to be very different based on purely that. And then shared versus personal. I think that if you were to ask somebody, or somebody was to ask you, can I borrow your tablet? People are typically a little bit more comfortable sharing their tablets. When you ask them, hey, can I use your phone? People are a little bit more standoffish, it's like, wait, why do you want my phone, phone for? There's, it's a lot more personal. Like the phone has become a very, very personal thing. Uh, when I got my uh, iPhone, for, uh, my uh, first smartphone, I remember the lady at the counter telling me, this device is going to change your life. It's a very, very, you're going to develop a very personal relationship with this device. And I thought, lady, you're crazy. Uh, but she was right. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, like you, most of the apps that you, that you use on your phone are of extremely personal nature. Like you, use, you, you check your email, you check messages, you make phone calls, you, you know, uh, Google Maps. Like uh, people tell me, hey, that's not personal. How much more personal can you get than telling you your exact position in the world? Like it's very, very personal data. So I wanted to talk about the Zappos team and how it's structured. So we have our uh, design team uh, who designs all of the features for our iOS, Android, and uh, mobile website. We have the team of engineers, iOS, Android, and MDOT, and our backend services team that develop all of the APIs that allow us to connect to all of the website services. So uh, our apps, we don't necessarily develop a full-on checkout process or a full-on uh, product or search uh, services. We consume the same services that are available on the website. We only expose all the same points via APIs. So the backend service team allow us to kind of uh, create that bridge, and it allow us to have a very small team. Uh, our Zappos team is made up of 12 people. Uh, then we have a QA team and a customer support team that also um, supports our, uh, our uh, applications. So the iOS team obviously develops the iPhone app and the iPad app. And you may think, well, yeah, of course, you, you know, the iOS team will develop an iPhone app and an iPad app. Isn't that the same? Uh, the truth is, like I was uh, talking about earlier, iPhone and iPad are going to be very different. And they are different at Zappos. So if you look at the home screen uh, for our iPad versus our iPhone, you will see that the iPad has a lot more features. Like you can see like the exploration of our categories is much deeper. Whereas if you look at the iPhone side, you see very selected sort of uh, category groups that have been vetted and put together just for uh, ease of consumption. 
if you look at the uh, bottom tab uh, area, you will see that you know, obviously on the iPhone, you'll need those uh, button icons to be much bigger, whereas on the iPad, uh, they're uh, slightly smaller, uh, but uh, that is because the, the device itself is much larger. So uh, the strategy changes quite a bit. The usability changes quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Maybe next, next screen. There we go. So the iOS, uh, oops, it went too far. OK, so the, and the, our product page screen is the same way. Whoa, there we go. That's, that was interesting. So yeah, our uh, I, iOS uh, product screen also is fairly different as well. You can see that on the iPad, there's a lot more information available to you right away. Whereas on the iPhone, it's just kind of focused on giving people the options, you know, the different color sizes. There is a tab to kind of explore product information, but that's not cluttering the space. So, and you can see the app to cart and favorite buttons being really large, really prominent. Whereas on the iPad screen, I mean, they're obviously available, but the, you know, the design is quite different. So the Android team develops the Android tablet, phones, and Kindle apps. And oh, I wonder if it's going to do the same thing again. OK. So the Android home screen, also different on the tablet than the phone. Similar issues that we had with the, uh, with the iOS, uh, iPad, and iPhone. And let's see. And our iPhone product screen, also quite different. Now, the differences don't stop just as the, uh, between the iOS uh, you know, tablets and phones, but we also differentiate between the operating systems. So if you look at uh, iOS versus Android, and these are the phone screens. Um, so on the iPhone, you can see this, uh, our design is quite different from the Android phone screen. Uh, and this was a little bit of an interesting challenge for me. I think when our Android developers came to me and said, hey, we want to develop a very customized Android experience that tailors to our Android customers. At first, I thought, wait, no, let's not do that because, you know, branding. <laughs> let's make sure that, you know, like, we're not going to confuse our customers. But it turns out that they were right. Like, developing a user experience that's tailored for Android customers was able to, again, just connect with our Android customers that much more because people who uh, have chosen to buy an Android device, they are sold to that user experience. And to force them into an iOS device, into an iOS uh, look and feel, it's kind of like telling uh, you know, I, uh, a Mac user to download a Windows program that looks just like Windows. Like, that's not going to work. People have particular uh, preferences, and you kind of want to work towards the strengths. So um, even though I had my hesitations towards launching uh, very different user experiences, in the end, our conversions for Android just went through the roof. <laughs> it was really, really crazy. And you know, part of it is you know, the design patterns. You see like the tab bar for Android being at the top versus the iOS being at the bottom. And that's because the Android devices have you know, buttons at the bottom of the screen, and you don't want to interfere with that user experience. So I mean, that's just one example of that. But the whole user experience, like I said, is quite different. And that, uh, the returns of making that investment was just uh, humongous. And we have iOS specific features. So on iOS, we have uh, used it as a platform for testing, as we have done in Android. So we have uh, this feature that we weren't sure we wanted to test uh, or uh, launch, uh, but we wanted to test it. Uh, so we built something called negative filtering, which allowed people to say, I don't want any items that are gray or white, and be able to pull that. And you know, that actually worked out. And uh, now that we know that uh, that feature is actually something that our customers like and use, now we can go ahead and implement it on Android. Have we actually stuck to parity and said, no, you have to do parity across Android and I iOS? This feature would have taken much longer. And say it actually didn't resonate with our customers, we have lost all that time building it. Uh, the other feature that I have, um, I'm not sure if I talked to a couple of people, was like the little cat that goes in and adds products to the cart. That's an iOS-specific feature. Our customers tend to love that. Uh, so we added uh, you know, app settings that allows people to select whether they want a dog or a robot to take their item and put it in their cart. Doesn't really do anything, 
but people just love that feature. Uh, on Android, uh, we experimented with widgets. Uh, we built, built a widget that tells people, uh, their, uh, that allows them to track their item. So people don't have to log into the app and you know, find their order and find out where, where their items are. They can just access this widget and immediately find out where the item is. <coughs> and it's very, a very, very Android-specific feature that if I stuck to parity, we would not have developed. And we also developed a uh, Daydream uh, app, which is um, a screensaver for Android devices, very specific to Android. What this does is, depending on your geolocation, uh, we, fi we find out the weather. And if it's raining, we'll recommend like, weather, weather items that sort of match that particular location. <laughs> so native apps versus mobile website. Uh, so I've talked a lot about apps, but there's still a lot of value to having a mobile website. Uh, for one, it's uh, cross-platform. So no matter which device you own, uh, if you implement it right, all of the devices are going to be able to access this mobile website. So you don't, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to develop like, every tailored native experience from the get-go. You can start experimenting by building a mobile website, get the data, and understand where your strategy should go. Are there more iOS users? Are there more Android users? Are there more iPad users? Are there more tablet users? You want to look at that. Discoverability. People are not going to find your app from the get-go um, uh, without knowing who you are, without knowing the product that you have available. On a mobile website, uh, if you use Google on your phone, you'll be able to kind of find, uh, you know, Google will expose all that product. Uh, and that's something that you won't have with native apps. If you have a native app, like I said, a customer has to go to an app store and download that app. And so you want to be in front of customers, and discoverability is a great, uh, really big piece and a really strong argument to having a mobile website. Commitment to loyalty. Like, you know, uh, only people who are truly loyal to your brand, who are really committed to buying from you, are going to download an app. People who just casually use your site and may not necessarily want to download your app are not going to do it. Uh, control over release cycles. Everybody who has an iOS app knows here that uh, when you try to release an app, it takes a while for uh, uh, Apple to release it. You have no control over that. If you have a mobile website, you are in total control. Rollbacks and monitoring. Uh, mobile websites. You know, websites have been around a long, a long while. You have tons and tons of tools that allow you to monitor and 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 do rollbacks, whereas on you know, mobile devices, we're just kind of getting there. Uh, the same thing with A-B testing. A-B testing natively is very challenging today. Uh, but, you know, uh, so it's much easier to do on a mobile website. And trends that we see. Uh, technologies, devices, and software will continue to improve. So all those challenges that I mentioned earlier about you know, rollbacks, monitoring, A-B testing, I think all of those issues will eventually be resolved, and we'll be able to kind of get uh, even more, uh, uh, you know, more, more inroads into developing the proper applications that we would like for our customers to use. Uh, aggregation of data. This will continue to be very important. I will continue to gather all this information from all of these different devices, because right now it's a little bit fragmented. The you know, data that, that comes from Mobile devices may not necessarily be integrated with the data of what you're collecting that, uh, of the user behavior that's taking place on a website. But I think all of this behavior slowly is kind of merging, and we will see you know, a better understanding of what our ecosystem looks like. And lastly, personalization. I think any app, for it to have any chance of being successful, will have to be tailored to our customer and have very, very specific features that are that are going to resonate with our customers, whether it is products that are tailored to the customer when they open the app, or whether it's information about products that are only uh, particularly interested to those customers. Personalization is going to play a really key piece in your mobile strategy. And that is it. Looking at what people have been saying on Twitter, they love the presentation, and everybody's fascinated by the fact that for Android and uh -huh. iOS users, you do things differently. Yeah. I'm impressed as well, but I'm going to ask you a question sure. about that. If you would be working in a market which uh -huh. is about 120th the size uh -huh. of the US, North American market, and so uh -huh. on, 
Would it be profitable to do it? Because if we look at the Netherlands, it's a much smaller market. Is it, is it, would it be profitable sure. in, a, in a much much smaller business? I, I believe it can be. Uh, but you, know, you have to really do your analysis. Look at the data that you have available, see where, where your customer is going. I think not taking advantage and not you know, realizing that co your customers are using all of these devices uh, you know, could harm you. Like your competitors could get in front of you and take those customers away from you. You have to really know. Uh, you know, kind of stay a little bit ahead of the game. Like, you know, the uh, quote that you had earlier about, you know, starting uh, earlier makes me look like I'm running faster. Exactly the same thing. Like, you have to be ahead of your competition, understand where your customers are, and, and make sure that you don't lose that opportunity. You mentioned personalization. What we saw is still largely context-based, operating system-based. Mm -hmm. How far is uh, Zappos today already in personalization? Um, yeah. We actually have been very fortunate. I mean, for, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like we were acquired by Amazon. So we have been able to use a lot of Amazon technology, which has been great. Uh, you know, we're not sharing data across, but we are sharing systems that allow us to understand our own data better. Yeah. So we're able to kind of build all these recommendations based on this technology that's now available to us. I'm going to ask one final question. Right. It's got nothing to do with your presentation directly, but okay. indirectly. All right. When we say Amazon, we say low prices, competing on price. Sure. We also say Amazon, excellent customer service. When we say Zappos, uh -huh. it is the ultimate goal in customer service. You gave quite some examples. How important is price for your customers? So we are working with a different customer base, right? I think that people who want a better service are, are coming to us. And so... Uh, for us, I mean, not to say that we can just charge any amount, but yeah. it has to be a fair price. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we are not in the business of competing for price. That is yeah. not our goal.